Welcome to this bonus episode in season two of the Explore the Circular Economy show, where we discuss and debate ideas and examples surrounding the circular economy. In today's episode, Laura Franco Hennel, the Learning Engagement Manager here at the Alan MacArthur Foundation, will be in conversation with Kate Rayworth, author of Donut Economics Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. In their conversation, Laura and Kate will be discussing how they, what the donut economic model looks like, how this model can be downscaled to city level with reference to Amsterdam, and also what the future of this model will hold for creating cities that are prosperous and thriving throughout the world. My name is Rob, I'm part of the learning team here at the Foundation, and we hope that you enjoy this episode. Thank you. And well, your book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, it has been translated to over 18 languages, I think. You teach at Oxford University and you are recognized as like one of our sustainable development thinkers, the main, one of the main ones in, the, in this century. Um, you've just launched uh, last year the Donut Economics Action Lab, which we're going to be talking about uh, in a bit. And, but a lot of us are wondering, um, what has been your journey to get here, to, to sit down, and I am sure it has taken a long time to design a framework that also incorporates uh, how to solve some of our environmental and social challenges? Yeah, okay, well, it started um, being a teenager of the 1980s. And what I saw on the news was a hole in the ozone layer and a famine in Ethiopia. And I thought, I want to learn the mother tongue of public policy. I want the tools that mean I can help be part of tackling that and solving those issues. So I thought economics was the subject to study. So off I skipped to university and I studied economics and was quickly disillusioned because I found the issues that I cared most about were somehow at the margins of the curriculum, often called externalities. And so I actually ended up walking away from economics because I was frustrated by it. And Anna, to be honest, I was embarrassed ever to say, hello, I'm an economist. That wasn't a frame a name that I felt proud of. So I, I walked away from academic economics and I immersed myself in the real world economy. I spent three years working in the villages of Zanzibar with micro entrepreneurs. I spent four years working on the human development report at the UN. And then I spent over a decade at Oxfam, bringing these worlds together and working to change the rules of global business and global uh, international trade to improve the lives of the world's poorest people. And in that process, I, well, I became a mum as well, a mother of twins. And when I came back to work after having immersed myself in the unpaid care economy of being a parent, I could just see so much more than what my economics education ever taught me. And I encountered the concept of planetary boundaries. I saw this diagram that was drawn in 2009 of, of, the, of, the, of a circle that we needed to live within Earth's life supporting systems and that we were overshooting them. And this had a huge impact on me. Literally, I felt it in my body when I saw this picture because I felt it was the beginning of 21st century economics. So I doodled on that diagram. I drew another circle on the inside and said, if, if there's an outer limit of human, uh, of human pressure on the planet, there's also an inner limit of human well-being. And it came out looking like a donut. When we published this as Oxfam, the... the traction it had was huge, much beyond what I had imagined. And it made me realize first the power of pictures, that what we see can frame what we, what we put at the center of our vision and what we leave out, but also that there was just a huge energy internationally of people searching for a new paradigm, a new vision, a new proposition of what we're for. And so I ultimately ended up leaving my job at Oxfam to do what I thought was the most effective piece of advocacy I could do next and write a book, Donut Economics, and, and say, if, if the donut is the goal of where we want to get to, what are the traits of a 21st century economist that would enable us to get there? What's the book that I wish I could have read when I was an economics student? Because I want to pass those ideas on, and they're coming from generations of feminist economists and ecological economists and systems thinkers. Can we bring them together and make them accessible to every student and every person? So that's what I aim to do in Donut Economics. And I'm, I'm thrilled by the traction it's had. And again, it just tells me that people are up for this and they're already on this. And this is a movement underway. 
Absolutely, and, and I mean, Kate, as, as an economist and as an as an well as a student that I was not so long ago, I have to thank you for for making this book because it has actually, like, uh, it's one of the reasons why I decided to work on this. So, but for the for our audience who might not be so familiar with your framework, um, could you show us how it looks? Like, I think you have an image or something with you. Yeah, I always have a donut on the stick nearby. So here's the donut. And I offer it as a compass for 21st century prosperity. So the idea is imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of this picture. And that means the hole in the middle is a place where people don't have the essentials of life. They don't have the food, water, healthcare, housing, education, income, political voice, gender equality that every person has a claim to. We must leave no person in the world in the hole of this donut get everybody over the social foundation and into the green ring itself. That was even a 20th century ambition to meet the needs of all. But in the 21st century, we know more. We know that if we try to do this in a way that excessively and misuses Earth's resources, we push ourselves beyond this ecological ceiling. We start to break down the life supporting systems of planet Earth on which all of our lives depend and we cause climate breakdown and we acidify the oceans, we create a hole in the ozone layer, catastrophic levels of biodiversity loss. And these are the nine planetary boundaries that Earth system scientists say are the life supporting systems that make this planet the one habitable planet of life in the universe that we know of. So we'd be crazy to kick ourselves out. If you put those two together, the goal of getting into the donut is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. It's that simple. The question is, how do we get there? And I believe we need to create a regenerative and distributive economy to take us in that direction. And something that, that, that caught my attention when I looked at your framework, Kate, was that in order to measure all these kind of indicators, you are measuring them using um, social and, and, and natural metrics. You are not using dollars or pounds uh, to, to, you know, to talk about them. And, and, and I don't know, surely some, some politicians and especially economists who are really obsessed with talking about monetary metrics um, would say that perhaps using one type of metric would be easier. Or why are you doing this? Why are you talking in this kind of metrics? So it's a great question. I'd say that in the 20th century, when GDP was invented by a brilliant American economist called Simon Kuznets, he was asked to put a single dollar figure on the output of the US economy for the first time in the 1930s. And he did. But even he warned at the time that this number could scarcely be taken as a measure of the welfare of a nation. He knew that it left out the unpaid caring work of families. It left out the value of the community. And even though it told you what had been bought and sold, it didn't tell you what had been lost in the process. It priced timber, but not the loss of a forest. So Simon Kuznets himself knew that it shouldn't be used that way, but there's a real power that lies in a single number, which is why GDP became this focus of how much can you make your economy grow? It became the focus of the Cold War between the US and the USSR, which ideology can turn out more stuff. And so our nations became addicted to pursuing growth, almost like a horse race, and that was a very 20th century uh, pursuit without recognizing these planetary boundaries. When we recognize the economy needs to be within the ecosystems, then the idea of something that grows endlessly doesn't make sense. And so I think we need to start over again. And if Simon Kuznets were alive today, if he had today the data that's becoming available, we can measure the carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. We can measure the acidity of the oceans. We can measure the health and the life expectancy of individuals. We can measure the nutrition, the education rates. We have phenomenal data available to us that his generation never did. I think he would be on the team of saying, it's time to move away from this one number. We need a dashboard. And since there is a power in one number, there's also a power in one image, and some brilliant researchers at Leeds University have downscaled the donut for over 150 countries and created these single images where you can see for each country the extent to which people are falling short on the essentials of life and to the extent to which the country is in overshoot. So we can get that single impression. It's just not in one number. It's in an image, and it actually tells us a lot richer story, a lot more nuanced story about the journey that every country now needs to go on. 
And, and a particular question I have about uh, one of the indicators that, uh, that it's also quite interesting is that you, you mentioned gender equality and, 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 and it's clearly there, not, not just equality in general, but gender equality. And I know you've placed a lot of emphasis on, on your diagrams around the economics and including the households and including the commons, um, which have been quite overlooked in the 20, 20th century uh, economics. Um, why is it so important that we take into account uh, women as part of this new narrative that we are creating? Well, what's really important is that, as you say, we recognize the, the value and, and well-being is created in many different ways that we provision for our wants and needs. So 20th century economics or even 19th century economics was written by wealthy white men from colonial nations. And that has consequences. Adam Smith was living at home with his mother who made his dinner every day when he wrote about the power of the market to provide our dinner. It wasn't just the market, it was his mum and her unpaid caring work too. He didn't notice it and so he didn't write it into his theories. So it has implications of who writes the theories, what they notice. I think we need to start economics recognizing that the economy is made up of four very different ways that we provision for our wants and needs. The first one, some people call it the core economy because it's so at the core of our lives, is the household all the unpaid caring work that goes into caring for our children, raising our children, feeding, cooking, washing, cleaning, caring for our parents. That is the essential of human well-being. Also the commons where people come together, not through the market or the state, but as a community and create community, whether it's creating community gardens, community centers, whether it's creating Wikipedia online or shared resources. And I think through the era of COVID, Communities have rediscovered the importance of that connection and community and what it means. And so there's the, the household and the commons, as well as the far more familiar market, which is based on price exchange, and the state providing public goods to citizens and residents who pay in taxes. So we need the market, the state, the household, and the commons. And I believe they're interdependent. They've always been interdependent. But when economics starts with supply and demand and puts the market at the center of our vision, and then says, well, where markets can't reach, perhaps you need the state. It completely misses out the household and the commons. And when you miss things out, you, you exploit them. You abuse the value that they create, you undervalue it and you overexploit it. So we need to start economics from day one with recognizing all of these. And of course, gender stereotype roles mean that women far more than men have been caught in providing that unpaid caring need in the household. And so a lot of women's time and a lot of women's work hasn't shown up in GDP, but it's been essential to household and to community organizing. It's time to start with the value and recognize all of that and then ask how can we redistribute and recognize that work between women and men so that that work's not gonna go away. It takes time and care to raise kids and care for your parents, but to redistribute it between women and men so it's far more equitable. So, so Kate, you've, we've spoken about, you've shown us a very different picture, as you say, from that crisscross supply demand diagram that we are all presented with in our first day in, in an economics bachelor's uh, or in any degree. Um, but um, what I'm thinking now is, where, where is the economy in your framework? What kind of, of thinking uh, do economists, uh, economists in the 21st century need? Because um, in, in the diagram, we can see the planetary boundaries, the social foundations, but where are the economics? Yeah, it's a really good question because, because an economist might say, well, I can't see the economy here. Where is it? And I very intentionally took away the normal indicators that we start with of the economy because I wanted to say, let's start with the fundamentals. Let's start with the fundamentals of human well-being. And these are drawn from the Sustainable Development Goals. So all the governments in the world have already agreed that all the people in the world have a claim to meeting these essential needs. And let's start with the fundamentals of planetary health. I mean, after all, economics means the art of household management. How the heck can you presume to manage the household if you even, don't even understand it? So let's understand this household, its planetary boundaries. Let's understand its people and their essential needs. Now we've put in place the fundamentals of economics. Now we can invite economic thinking and reasoning into the room and say, what kind of institutions, what balance between market, state, household and commons, what kind of incentives and regulations will enable us to meet these goals? And the economy is here. I've written it here. It says regenerative and distributive 
economy. And the reason that's what I wrote is because I believe what we need to focus on is creating dynamics that start bringing us into the donut. Because right now we are way outside on both sides. Billions of people fall short on their essential needs and we're overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. And what that tells us is we have an economy that's deeply degenerative. We are running down the life supporting systems of our planet. And we need to transform that degenerative dynamic into a regenerative dynamic where we work with and within the cycles of the living world. But we also have an economy that's deeply divisive where the returns of value and opportunity are, are so often driven into the hands of a 1%. So we have billions of people who can't meet their essential needs and a doubling of number of billionaires in the world in the past decade. So we need to turn this divisive economic dynamics into distributive economic dynamics. So for me, the 21st century economy is absolutely in the donut. The question is, how are we going to make our economy regenerative? And how are we going to make it distributive? And that is there, that's the entry point. Now let's talk about economics in those terms. Let's reframe the starting point and let's dive in from there. So important to talk about, about framing. And, and what I'm getting is that you basically are thinking about two main principles for the economy. So it has to be regenerative by design and distributive by design. And I think a lot of the work of what we do at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation overlaps here with, with the work that you do, um, because, because we want to have a regenerative economy. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Kate, um, as part of this, what role do you think the circular economy plays in this? I think it's key. So let me grab my favorite piece of hosepipe. You know, this is our degenerative economy. It's the linear take, make, use, lose of industrial systems that we've inherited. And that linear degenerative process is what pushes us over planetary boundaries. It takes again and again from Earth sources. It throws waste again and again into Earth sinks. We have to turn this linear arrow into a circular one, right? We have to work with and within the cycles of the living world so that resources are never used up. They're used again and again, far more collectively, more creatively, and more carefully and more slowly. So I think a circular economy is an, a necessity in the search of becoming regenerative. It's, it, we can't do it without reusing resources and recognizing that waste from one process is food for the next. How do we make that distributive at the same time? For me, that's the really interesting question. How do we make sure that the circular economy not only takes us towards regenerative design, it takes us towards distributive design? So for example, I believe we need industries where, that make products that have the right to repair, that are modular by design, so that instead of individual companies having their own circular supply chain, send everything back to me and it's within my intellectual property rights and these are my materials and nobody else knows how I use them. And it's a kind of corporate loop that is never going to work because nature doesn't do that. Nature doesn't create a series of a hundred little loops. Nature creates an ecosystem, right? And nature puts resources back into the ecosystem, back as basic building blocks and then starts again. So if we want to mimic nature in the way we create circular economies, we need an ecosystem of plastics use and an ecosystem of metals and an ecosystem of electronics and an ecosystem of ceramics. And that means that the materials need to be labeled and open source in their design. So anyone who ends up with a material in their hand knows what kind of material it is and is able to feed it back into the ecosystem. So I think it has really far reaching implications for ensuring that we don't go down this corporate siloed circularity, but that we have a, a ecosystem circularity. And that requires a regulation and a collaboration between industries to make that ecosystem and to make those shared commons based technologies and shared standards that everybody can connect to. But also I would say that the circular economy has a huge potential to be uh, an employment creating, a job creating and a meaningful job creating economy, right? There's, there's creativity and joy and meaning in figuring out how to use Earth's resources again and again, how to repurpose them, what can they become next time? So it enables architects and engineers and designers to be innovative and to come up with new solutions. And those are the folks I meet who work in big companies who can't wait to get going making these new designs. They're often held behind a lobby, a kind of corporate lobby that are trying to stop any change in regulations. But if only that corporate lobby would get out of the way and the regulations could be changed, the innovative inspiration of that generation of designers can be unleashed. And so there's a lot of good jobs. I mean, again, if I bring back this network, Think of all the jobs required to make the connections between these nodes. It is an employment creating 
system. So that's another way in which it can be distributed by design. So I think it connects very closely with the work of the Anna MacArthur Foundation. And I think the question always is how do we ensure that as we promote the circular economy, it doesn't become a siloed corporate captured circular economy, it becomes part of a large ecosystem and it's distributive by design as well. And this shows the, the importance of having a system approach and, and really including all the actors uh, of our economy and not just the businesses, but also the policy makers, the academics and the communities, uh, etc. So you're presenting us with a very different picture that can set di very different indicators and, and, and ultimately lead to different policies, different businesses and different ways of, of doing stuff. Um, and, and you mentioned you, you published The Donut in 2012, your book in 2017, and, and I know you've been working really hard on, on how to downscale this, this, this framework, which can perhaps seem a bit like, uh, theoretical, and, and how to actually apply it uh, to the different levels of the economy. Um, so cities. Why, why are you focusing on cities, Kate? And, and, and how, do you, how do you move from that image, that framework, to actually uh, talking about uh, the city level? Yeah, so when the donut was first published in 2012, it is a, it is a compass for the global or the planetary scale. It, it tries to plot all of humanity within the planetary boundaries. And very quickly, people started saying, can we turn that into a tool for here? for our city, our town, our nation, our country, and wanted to downscale it. And for years, we couldn't figure out how would you downscale it? What would that look like? What's the smart way to do that? And then I got into a fantastic conversation with the biomimicry thinker, Janine Benyus, who had a sort of flipped the donut inside out, as it were, and had this idea for, for using it. And we put our ideas together and we came up with a, a framework for downscaling it, which I feel very confident has a huge ability to be applied at multiple scales. So it could be applied from a neighborhood to a town, to a city, to a district, to a nation, or even to a community of nations. And we've started with cities, partly because there's a real energy going on in cities in these current decades. There's something about cities. Is it that they're the right size, that they can make a difference, but they're not so big that people can't connect? There's a pride, certainly here in the UK, I think people feel more of a pride of the city that they're part of rather than saying, I'm proud to be part of the UK. So there's more of a connection with that level of place. And also a lot of cre creating economic transformation happens in the way we lay out our streets, in the way we move materials around. So there's something about the spatial scale of a city that can try out new things. We also got in touch with the C40, which is a network of 96 cities with mayors who have committed to transforming their cities to, to keep global heating under 1.5 degrees. And they said, we'd like to use the donut with some of our most ambitious cities. So we started working together. That's how we began the work with cities. And we've actually begun in the cities of the global north in the high income countries, because we think they have the greatest obligation and responsibility to lead this transformation, given their historic responsibilities for climate and um, ecological impacts. So we've begun with them. And um, so, in, for cities, I know you have four main lenses that you look at when you try to approach the donut framework. What, what, what are they and, and why was it so important to incorporate uh, as well the global perspective? So here's the question that we invite any ambitious city, any city that wants to be fit for the 21st century, we invite it to ask itself and I, and I just would invite anybody listening to this to think of a city that they know and love and look at it through this lens. So here's the question. How can your city be a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? So that's a big question. And you can hear in it, there's both local aspiration to be thriving people, whatever it means to the people of, of your city. You know, what it means to thrive will be different to the people of Dar es Salaam as to the people of Stockholm. So let each culture and community bring their history, their meaning, their way of living and say, this is what it means to thrive here for us. And how are we doing against that? And then also part of the local aspiration, what does it mean for your city to be a part of a thriving place? Like every city on the planet is located in a different part of Earth's ecosystems. Some are mountains, some are in valleys, some are in the equator, some are in the Arctic Circle. 
and what nature's doing in those places varies. So nature has a genius, as Janine Benyus would say, of thriving differently in each of these places. And we can learn from nature and aim for our cities to belong in that habitat. So let's say I'm in the city of Oxford in the UK and, and the nearest natural habitat is a place called Whiteham Woods, just a couple of miles outside the city. I could go to Whiteham Woods and say, this is what nature's doing here. This is how nature thrives. And let's take the measurements of white and wood. Let's measure how much carbon dioxide these woods are sequestering, how much groundwater they're storing after a storm, how much biodiversity the woods are housing, how much the woods are cooling the air in the summer from the treetops to the forest floor. So we take the metrics of nature and we say, what would it mean for our city to aim to actually match or even exceed the generosity of the wildland next door? so that our cities would be functionally indistinct from the wild land in which they're embedded. As Janine would say, we, we humans come to truly belong in the landscapes in which we are nestled. So that's local aspiration to be thriving people in a thriving place. And many cities just focus on that. We want to have good lives for our residents. We want to have clean air and clean water and nature nearby. But that local aspiration has to be set in the context of global responsibility because every city draws in resources from other parts of the world and is having an impact on people and planet worldwide. And we have to recognize that. So we also ask, how can your city aim to thrive while respecting the, the, the well-being of people worldwide? Think of all the food that's imported into a city every day, the clothing, the electronics goods, the con material, consumer goods, the uh, construction materials, whose labor went into picking and packing that food or stitching the clothes and packaging and transporting, mining the construction materials because people's labor and their communities worldwide have been affected for good or for bad, have been affected through the supply chains that are connected to the city. How can the city transform its supply chains through the way the government procures public goods, through the, through the products that are on sale in the city, through the lifestyle that we aspire to in the city so that we have far better impacts on the lives of people worldwide. And then the last lens is how do we ensure the city respects the well-being of the whole planet? So again, a city might have clean air and clean water, but it's importing from the whole world. And so its ecological impacts may be falling very, very far away, but very heavily through mining, through logging, through plastic pollution, through chemical processes. So how can the city take responsibility for all the materials it's importing and massively reduce that impact. And of course, a circular economy that reuses materials is gonna be a very important part of reducing that. So a thriving, a city that's home to thriving people in a thriving place, while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet. Local aspiration in the context of global responsibility. We think every 21st century forward-looking city should be asking itself these questions. And actually, Amsterdam has been the, the first one uh, to publish uh, to, or to make their donut uh, kind of a, a portrait a public uh, in the middle of the pandemic, which is also something that is it's very important to acknowledge. Um, and you always say, Kate, that your strategy is to not try to push the donut on anybody, that you try to go where the energy is. So does this mean that Amsterdam and also uh, Portland and Philadelphia, which have been the other two cities that, that, that did this, uh, well, that, that pioneered uh, using your framework. Does this mean that they, that they went to you and said, we want to apply the framework? Did you go to those cities for a particular reason? So you're absolutely right. Part of the strategy of the way we work is to go where the energy is. We don't knock on shut doors. And the beauty of that strategy is that we've never once said to anybody, we think you should use or please talk about or please show it. We've never pushed the donut ever. It's all through pull. It's all through people who say, mm, this looks like a useful tool for us. We think we want to use it. And that means you're flowing where there's already mobilization and already action happening. And if you are a small player in the world, I mean, for a long time, it was just me, but now we're a team of seven people. If you want to be a small team with a big impact, you need to work with self-organizing uh, play, people who are, have their own energy and their own inspiration. Amsterdam uh, was already starting to draw up its circular st economy strategy. So Amsterdam set for itself the goal of becoming a 100% circular economy by 2050. And personally, I love that goal because it's a, a crazy moonshot. Nobody actually knows what it would mean to be 100% circular, but it's the kind of ambition you need to aim for. 
and figure out how you're going to do it as you move towards it. They'd also set themselves the goal of having no fossil fuel vehicles in the city by 2030. So they were starting to have some very ambitious goals. They're also a city that's committed to participation and democratization and inclusion. So they realized they had these different strategies that were somehow not yet connected. And I think the donut provided a framework in which they could see everything brought together. And as they drew up their circular economy strategy, they used the donut as a reflective tool, uh, different, different ways in which you could move towards a circular economy. How does that show up in the donut? Which parts of the donut would that be affecting for good or could it have damaging effects? And so they used it to think holistically. And then when we started to downscale, Amsterdam said, we want to do this, right? We, 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 we want to be involved and I've got it right here. Here's the Amsterdam's report, their, their city portrait. Um, and, and they've, they've done it and, and did publish it in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic in the, in the month in which Amsterdam had its highest infection rate in April. We worked on it from about September to December last year. And many people thought they'd say, you know, we can't publish it. We're, we've got this crisis. But they said, well, no, we have to continue functioning as a city. But also, when we're going to emerge from this COVID emergency, wh where are we going to go? Which way do we want to point? This is exactly what we want to be using to tell ourselves that as we emerge from an emergency, we invest, we orient, we tip ourselves towards that place we already knew we wanted to go. And I think what when they published in April and it got covered in the newspapers, it went viral. I mean, it was it, the, the, the pickup and the interest internationally was huge. And to me, again, this is a signal that there are people and places worldwide who are searching for new ways of doing things. And maybe when there's one crazy lady standing there saying, I have a donut on a stick, that's, that's one thing, you know, but could you actually do this? When a city, when a city like Amsterdam says, yes, and now we're starting to do it, that is what I call peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. And that's when the energy really kicks in because people are most inspired by people like themselves who were already doing that thing that they thought was impossible. So a mayor is inspired by another mayor or a teacher by a teacher or a CEO by a CEO or a school child by a school child. And so when Amsterdam published, they gave an amazing amount of energy and confidence to other cities and places to jump in and start doing it themselves. And that's what we've seen since. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Kate, have you, have you found um anything particularly challenging. And, and, I, and I mean, because when you talk about these four lenses, it, it seems like you, you need to have a lot of data uh, and to be able to measure progress towards the, uh, to, towards the, the donut and, and, and improvements. Um, is this the case? Have you found uh, data gaps? There's definitely data gaps. And that's absolutely to be expected, right? When you're trying to create a new paradigm and orient in a new direction and care about new things, of course, the data is not going to be there because we weren't measuring that. We weren't caring about that before. Data on are we becoming regenerative? Are we becoming circular? Are we becoming distributive? It's, it's hard because we haven't tried to do this before. But you know what? I mentioned that I worked on the Human Development Report uh, in the late 1990s. And when the Human Development Report was the, you know, there had been the World Bank producing uh, reports about each country's GDP per capita and GDP growth for decades. And suddenly the Human Development Report came out and was producing the Human Development Index, which only wanted to show the rate of enrollment of children in schools in a country, life expectancy, and income per capita. And there were huge data gaps because so many countries were not collecting this data. And there was a decision in the early days of the Human Development Report, we will publish these tables anyway, and we will publish all the data gaps because the data gaps in themselves are important political information. We have not been paying attention to the right things. So of course we have found it difficult to find the right data and the ideal data that you'd want to bring to these portraits. But this is part of the process. In fact, in Amsterdam, the folks who are collating the data, they have now got a fantastic project of coming up with new monitoring systems to monitor the circular economy, to monitor food waste, to monitor the, all the kinds of things that show up in the donut. So, those data gaps are part of a project. And I think we'll look back in 10 years time. I really hope we look back in 10 years time. We'll look back at the donut and how we were measuring it, whether at the global level or at the city level. And we'll say that was really crude what they were doing in 2020. And I really hope it looks crude because I hope they've moved on, but we won't get there unless we start here. 
And, and, and it's also part of what we are trying to achieve here at the foundation. We are asking the, ourselves those questions. What is a circular uh, company? Um, how, what, how does a circular city look like? Um, actually, a couple of weeks ago, we had, we had here the OECD, which is going to publish at the end of October uh, a framework um, to help uh, cities towards measuring uh, how circular they are and their progress that they've, that they've done. And this sounds like a lot of work, Kate, and I hope you are not doing it alone. You, we've mentioned the Donut Economics Action Lab. Um, what is it and, and, and what are you working on at the moment? So my book, Donut Economics, came out in 2017 and the traction was fantastic, but it meant I spent two years going around giving talks and presentations and talks and presentations about donut economics and what you could do. And in the end, I thought, OK, who actually wants to do this? In fact, who's already doing this? Because every day I was getting emails from teachers who saying I'm teaching this in the classroom, even though it's not on the curriculum or business startups that were saying we're using the donut as a framework for designing our business or, or cities that were saying we want to do this in our city. So I realized that actually, I think 21st century economics is going to be practiced first and theorized fully later. So let's get with the practice. And we've set up Donut Economics Action Lab as a very small team. We went from three people to seven people during lockdown. But the main purpose of, of what we're doing is creating an online platform that we launched just a few weeks ago so that anybody can become a member of the online community of Donut Economics Action Lab. And together there, we are co-creating tools of putting donut economics into practice and telling stories of how we've done it. So for example, the, the methodology we used for creating this uh, portrait of Amsterdam, we've written that up and we've published it on our platform. So this is how we did it. Because we're a tiny team. We don't, we're not looking to come and do this in every city. That would be crazy. What we're trying to do is open design. We are making available the tools that we've used so that teams in different cities can pick them up and use them themselves. And in that process, they'll adapt it, they'll improve it, they'll make it more relevant to where they are. And then we ask that they share back so that we are a, a community of co-creators who are making open design tools that will continually evolve. So for me, this is also a part of systems thinking. How do you create commons of ideas and designs that keep evolving and keep being more and more relevant to places. So that's what we're doing in Donut Economics Action Lab. And I hugely invite anybody to join us. It's just at donuteconomics.org. You can instantly become a member, have access to all the tools, all the stories, and become a contributor. And I, one, one, one of, the, of the greatest things I, I think I've seen is that you, you run a competition to, to, to see what could be the, another way that you could add to your book. Uh, to think like a 21st uh, century economist. Uh, what was the outcome of that? So my book's subtitle is Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. And I wrote that knowing, well, obviously there's going to be lots more. Here's just seven that I, I'm pretty sure are going to be useful. And I thought in the spirit of the wisdom of the crowd, let's come up with an eighth way. Because sometimes I would give a talk and people would say, what do you think is the eighth way? And I thought, well, let's see what everybody else thinks. Let's, let's see where the energy is. So together with the Rethinking Economics Network, which is a fantastic international network of students who want to rewrite the very subject that they're studying, we launched this competition and we did it at three levels. We did it for school students, for university students, and then for everybody else. And we had some brilliant submissions. It, everything had to be just experienced as a, as a response in three minutes. So you could write a thousand words of text, or you could make a three minute video or an animation, anything you like. So people were really inventive and we got wonderful um, ideas and responses. And we made a, a word cloud out of all the responses so that you could see not only who won, because it's not really about winning, it's about what does everybody, the hive mind think, you could see the big clusters and nature was missing and community and connection. These were some of the big concepts that people wanted to put at the heart of 21st century economics. And I love doing it because we did the whole competition, I think, for about 50 pounds. We made some, we made some little um, donuts on a stick, little trophies, and that was the only cost of it. And there's something beautiful about doing something that's costless because you're using distributed technologies, you're using the innovation and the enthusiasm of the crowd. And you can do something like that that's really co creative with the community. You don't need a huge budget. You don't need a huge organization. You can use these technologies we already have. If we're lucky enough to have access to online communications like this, we can use these technologies to co-create and collaborate. And I think the success of that competition is partly what made me think, 
I think Donut Economics Action Lab can be a longer term version of that kind of co-creation. Well, we look forward to seeing the development of the Donut Economic Action Lab. I want to ask you one last question, Kate, and it's, well, you, you were here uh, three years ago in Cows uh, on the Isle of Wight, and, and you said back then that you had not received big critiques of your work and you were inviting anyone to, to, to jump in in a conversation with you and explain to you what is it that they don't agree with from your framework. Has this changed in the last three years? So one good criticism could be, where is the rest of the living world? So the donut is quite anthropocentric. It puts humanity and human needs at the center and then says we need to do that within the means of the living world. And somebody could quite fairly say, well, what if we were to invite all living beings into the center and ask, what do all living beings need? So for example, you could, you could say that in terms of the planetary boundaries, Right? All living beings show up here in terms of ensure there's not too much biodiversity loss. We could take, this is life. Not, none of the rest of this is alive, but this is life. This is all other living creatures. And I just think it's a, it's a profound, uh, profound project to say, what if we took all other living beings and invited them into the middle of the circle and then said, how do we balance humanity and the needs of the rest of nature? And this would take us down the route of saying, obviously rewilding and the movement, for example, giving half to nature or the movements of the rights of nature. Uh, you can do those things in the frame of the donut, but there's something profoundly exciting about saying, let's bring all other living beings into this space with us and then hold that conference. And, and I would love to see somebody, somebody do that work. Thank you, Kate. It, it has been a pleasure to talk to you here today. And oh, we look pleasure to join you. And, and we look forward to having you hopefully in the future with us on the island again. Always, because this all keeps evolving. Let's, let's keep, keep the conversation going. <laughs>